Hi, it's Miss Blau, and today I'm going to read the story Bonnie's Big Day, written by James Harriet and illustrated by Ruth Brown. One sunny morning in early September, I drove to see old John Skipton at Dale Close Farms, since he had telephoned to say that one of his cart horses was lame. Lame is another word for injured or sore. As I got out of the car, the untidily dressed figure of the farmer came through the kitchen door of Dale Close Farm. John always seemed to look like a scarecrow, and today was no different. He was wearing a tattered buttonless coat, which was tied around his waist with string. His trousers were much too short, and as he hurried towards me, I could see that he was wearing socks of different colors. One was red and the other was blue. By working very hard when he was a young man, Mr. Skipton had saved enough money to buy his own farm with his handsome stone house. He had never married, and because he was always so busy looking after the sheep and cows on the hill, bringing in the harvest from the fields, and picking the apples in the orchard, he had been much too busy to worry about himself, which is why he always dressed in such very old clothes. The horses are down by the river, he said in his usual gruff manner. We'll have to go down there. He seized a pitchfork and stabbed it into a pile of hay, which he then hoisted onto his shoulder. I pulled my large gladstone bag from the car and set off behind him. It was difficult to keep up with the farmer's brisk pace, even though he must have been 50 years older than me. I was glad when we reached the bottom of the hill, because the bag was heavy and I was rather hot. I saw the two horses standing in the shallows of the pebbly river. They were nose to tail and were rubbing each other's chins gently along each other's backs. Beyond them, a carpet of green turf ran up to a high sheltered ridge, while around them were clumps of oak and beech trees, which blazed in the autumn sunshine. They're in a nice place, Mr. Skimpton, I said. Eh, they keep cool in the hot weather, and they've got the barn whenever the winter comes. At the sound of his voice, the two big horses came trotting up from the river, the gray one first, and the chestnut followed, a little more slowly and limping slightly. They were big, fine cart horses, but I could see they were old from the sprinkling of white hairs on their faces. Despite their age, however, they pranced around old John, stamping their enormous feet, throwing their heads about, and pushing the farmer's cap over his eyes with their muzzles. Get over! Leave off! he cried. He pulled the gray horse's forelock. This is Bonnie. She's well over 20 years old. Then he ran his hand on the front leg of the chestnut. And this is Dolly. She is nearly 30 now, and not one day's sickness until now. When did they last do any work? I asked. Oh, about 12 years ago, I reckon, the farmer replied. I stared at him in amazement. 12 years? Have they been down here all that time? Eh, hey, just playing around down here. They've earned their retirement. For a few seconds, he stood silent, shoulders hunched, hands deep into the pockets of his tattered coat. They worked very hard when I had to struggle to get this farm going, he murmured, and I knew he was thinking of the long years those horses had pulled the plow, drawn the hay and harvest wagons, and had done all the work which the tractors now do. I noticed that Dolly was a bit lame when I came down with their hay yesterday, he said. Lucky I come down each day. You mean that you climb down that hillside every day? I asked. Eh, rain, wind, or snow. They look forward to me bringing a few oats or some good hay. I examined Dolly's foot and found an old nail embedded deep in the soft part of her foot. I was able to pull it out quite easily with a pair of pliers and then I gave her an antibiotic injection to eliminate any risk of later infection. Climbing back up the hill, 
I couldn't help thinking how wonderful it was that old John made the long journey to see the horses in all weathers every day for 12 years. He certainly loved those great animals. A thought struck me, and I turned to him. You know, Mr. Skipton, it's the Derby show next Saturday. You should enter the mares in the family pets class. I know they are looking for unusual entries this year. Perhaps you should just take Bonnie, since Dolly's foot will be a bit sore for a few days. The farmer frowned. What on earth are you talking about? Go on, I said. Take Bonnie to the show. Those horses are your pets, aren't they? Pets? He snorted. You couldn't call one of those great big clodhoppers a pet. I've never heard anything so silly. When he got back in the farmyard, he thanked me gruffly, gave me a nod, and disappeared into the house. The following Saturday, it was my duty to attend Darabee's show as the vet in charge. I had spent a pleasant time strolling the showground, looking at the pens of cattle and sheep, the children's ponies, the massive bulls, and the sheepdog trials in the neighboring fields. Then, over the loudspeaker came the following announcement. Would the entrance for the family pets class please take their place in the ring? I was always interested in this event, so I walked over and stood by the secretary, who was sitting at a table near the edge of the ring. He was Derby's local bank manager, a prim little man with rimless spectacles and a pork pie hat. I could see he was pleased at the number of entrants now filling into the ring. He looked at me and beamed. They have certainly taken me at my word when I asked for unusual entries this year. The parade was led by a fine white nanny goat, which was followed by a pink piglet. Apart from numerous cats and dogs of all shapes and sizes, there was a goldfish in its bowl and at least five rabbits. There was a parrot on the perch and some budgies having an outing in their cage. Then, to an excited buzz of conversation, a man walked into the ring with a hooded falcon on his wrist. Splendid, splendid, cried Mr. Secretary. But then his mouth fell open, and everyone stopped talking as the most unexpected sight appeared. Old John Skipton came striding into the ring, and he was leading Bonnie, but it was quite a different man and horse than I had seen a few days before. John still wore the same old tattered coat tied with a string, but today I noticed that both his socks were the same color, and on his head, perched right in the center, was an ancient bowler hat. It made him look almost smart, but not as smart as Bonnie. She was dressed in full show regalia of an old-fashioned cart horse, her hooves were polished and oiled. The long feathery hair on her lower hooves had been washed and fluffed out. Her mane, tail, and forelock had been plated with green and yellow ribbons, and her coat had been groomed until it shone in the sunshine. She was wearing part of the harness from her working days, and it too had been polished, and little bells hung from the harness saddle. It quite took my breath away to look at her. Mr. Skipton, Mr. Skipton, you can't bring that great thing in here. This class is for family pets, cried Mr. Secretary, leaping from his chair. Bonnie is my pet, responded the farmer. She's part of my family, just like that old goat over there. Well, I disagree, said Mr. Secretary, waving his arms. You must take her out of the ring and go home. Old John Skipton put on a fierce face and glared at the man. Bonnie is my pet, he repeated. Just ask Mr. Harriet. I shrugged my shoulders. Perfectly true. This mare hasn't worked for over 12 years and is kept entirely for Mr. Skipton's pleasure. I'd certainly call Bonnie a pet. But, but, sputtered Mr. Secretary. Then he sat down suddenly on his chair and sighed. <sighs> oh. Very well, then. Go and get into line. Mm -hmm. 
So John turned and led Bonnie to a place right in the middle of the other competitors. On one side of them was the little pink piglet, and on the other side a tortoise. It was a most curious sight. The task of judging the pets had been given to the district nurse, who was very sensibly dressed in her official uniform to give her an air of authority. Judging this class was always difficult, and when she looked down the line and kept seeing the great horse, she knew it was going to be very difficult indeed. She looked carefully at every competitor, but her eyes always came back to Bonnie. All the rabbits were very sweet, and the felkiv was impressive, the dogs were charming, and the piglet was cute. But Bonnie was magnificent. First prize to Mr. Skipton and Bonnie, she announced, and everyone cheered. As the rosette was presented, a man came to take a photograph for the local newspaper. It looked as though the great horse knew all about her prize, as she posed there, dignified and beautiful. John, too, stood very erect, proud, but unfortunately, every time the photographer clicked the camera, Bonnie pushed the bowler hat over the farmer's eyes. It was the mayor's way of showing her love, but I couldn't help wondering how the picture would come out. After the show, I went back to Dale Close to help John undress Bonnie and I went with them down the hill to the field by the river. As we approached, Dolly came trotting up from the river, whinnying with pleasure to see her friend and companion again. Her foot is quite healed now, I said, noting the horse's even stride. In the gentle evening light, we watched the two old horses hurry towards each other. Then, for a long time, they stood, rubbing their faces together. Look at that, said old John, with one of his rare smiles. Bonnie is telling Dolly, all about her big day. And that's the picture from the newspaper. The end.